The next module of this lecture is about uh, the characteristics of the signals in space. The spatial characteristic space, I mean brain space, sizes of things and so on. And at the very coarsest scale, um, this is not going to be new for any cognitive scientist or psychologist or so, but maybe for an engineer. At the coarsest possible scale, you, s uh, you can assign different kinds of functions to various parts of the brain. Uh, and that is mostly because there are certain kinds of nerves ending at certain parts of the brain. For example, there is a strip here in the middle. It basically goes here. And it turns out that there is nerves coming from the sensory neurons that end there. And so if there's a neuron, it is most likely going to deal with interpretation of these sensory inputs. And likewise, there's also um, uh, you know, basically wires going down to the body for motor control. And so right there, there's also control neurons that drive you know, my hand movement. If I move my hand, it actually happens right there, uh, in there. Um, so that's why these things here are called motor cortex and somatosensory cortex. One is actually you know, a little bit further in front, the other is behind. Here's another example, and that's the visual cortex. So the, the nerves from my eyes end at the back of the head. They actually cross over somewhere in the middle. And so these neurons here are m much more likely to deal with visual processing than anything, any other part of the brain. Um, and so that's, that's exactly also what you observe in, in the data, basically. And there's I'm talking about coarse scales, but there's much, much finer de um, scale things happening, such as uh, wh what you find in the next layer are, are, you could say, neurons that operate on things um, that are generated by low-level visual cortex, such as they, they are more abstract um, representations, such as patterns in the patterns <laughs> of, of what you see like um, you know, body parts versus um, edges and corners and so on. Uh, and then there's areas in the brain which are very, very far away from anything that's really sensory or motor or, or in any way concrete. Like you know, the frontal lobe, there's no nerve coming from the body anywhere near this. And so we don't really know. You know you, the literature goes all over the place <laughs> when it comes to what this part of the brain is doing. But what we know is it's probably going to be more abstract. Like, you know, uh, I mean, there's parts in the brain that do memory and things like that, of course, uh, like hippocampus. Auditory part is basically here, and, and so on. Uh, there's also part that deals with language. And so there's brain atlases that are actually pretty detailed um, that you can get. Um, and that's, of course, always helpful to constrain where you want to look uh, in, in EEG and in, in basically all other measures. Uh, here's a slice through the motor part, which is here. It, it has the funny name homunculus. Um, so I, I show this with a mouse here. Um, uh, here's an area, for example, uh, generally which deals with hand-related uh, things, hand sensory experiences, hand motor control. Um, and uh, this is exactly where you see um, sources in, in EEG that are related to these kinds of things. Um, also notable is here is the sulcus, which is this kind of um, fold, uh, which is pretty dominant and is right under the hand area. So in many cases, you actually see this in a projection pattern. I'll show you a couple pictures later. Um, so you s actually see this is a body map. So it starts with the feet to the hand, face, and so on and so on, uh, probably just because this is the way in which the nerves are projecting there. So this is a pretty neat example. We understand it really well because we, you know, it's basically body, a body map, if you will. Um, the other part is we've discussed where things happen on the cortex, but we haven't really discussed how it gets from there to your sensors. And it may be somewhat non-intuitive. So um, when a, uh, a source in the brain, say a patch of cortex fires, it actually produces an electromagnetic field, propagates with the speed of light, basically, so instantaneous. Um, and so it projects to certain kinds of sensors, but it doesn't necessarily project to the sensor that's right on top. For example, this thing, if it's oriented like, if the cells are all oriented like that, they may project to these electrodes and those electrodes, but exactly not to this one. F this is a funny example. 
and it applies to two thirds of the cortex, which is in these folds. Um, and furthermore, everything, every source projects basically to every sensor. And so that's why you observe almost the same signal everywhere. But we are lucky because this mapping is linear, pretty much, you know. This electrode might pick up a stronger signal from here than that, and uh, these two are stronger than that, but it's a linear factor. And so each, no, uh, each electrode picks up a weighted sum of the signals from everywhere in the brain. And it's our job to disentangle these things and um, combine what we see at the electrodes in the right way so that we can focus on what a particular part in, in cortex is doing. So um, here's, here's a nice picture, by the way, of, um, of this volume conduction. It's a simulation done in our lab. When you have a patch of cortex like here, this blue one, the source patch firing, this is on the head where you observe it. You know, um, It's a very, very, very broad um, projection pattern. And it's not really intuitive. So here's, by the way, green is zero. Here's almost zero, and it's right above the patch. Um, so you know, that's just why it's statistically tricky to deal with that. Here's where we put the sensors usually. There's a system called the 1020 system, which is a very nice organization. And you should always <laughs> try to use a good labeling scheme. Otherwise, it gets really confusing. Um, I just very quickly talk you through this. So there's central electrodes that have names like C3, CZ, C4. There's frontal ones, F7, you know, F3, and so on. Prefrontal, and so on. There's parietal electrodes, P. There's occipital electrodes. Uh, they start with O. Temporal electrodes is here at the sides, is the T's, and a few others. You know, um, there are certain landmarks like here, the so-called nasion, the inion, which allows you to, to put the cap in some meaningful way. So, for example, CZ is right halfway um, on this uh, uh, path here, uh, and that's some way to to position a cap properly. And it's important to position a cap properly because you want consistency from session to session to session, of course. If you're off by a centimeter here, you're also off by a centimeter in cortex. And that might mean that you're, you're completely off from the source patch that you wanted to measure. But if you do actually measure where your electrodes are with a digitizer, you can sort of crack for that. But very few people have a digitizer and actually measure this properly. Also, I'm just talking about session to session transfer. If you ignore every previous session and you just learn everything from scratch, for a given session using machine learning, you don't have to deal with the cap placement at all. You just slap it on and do whatever you want. But if you want to integrate information across multiple recording sessions, you need to deal with that kind of alignment issue. Uh, here's a somewhat more higher resolution thing. This goes up to ridiculously high resolutions and very, very long names here, C, C, P, Z, or something like that. Um, here's some actual maps of of brain sources on from real data uh, on the scalp. So you see this here in head plots. Um, you see it uh, here. So this is, for example, a dipolar projection pattern. This is negative on one side and rather positive on the other. This is also dipolar. It's pretty much positive, And that means that the neurons probably point up. Here's the nose, by the way. Here's the ears. The nose is usually on the top in our plots. This is, by the way, EEG lab plots. Um, and then there is a few which are harder to interpret. But that's what we get for a single, say, independent source. Um, I'll talk about independence later. And so when you get the projection like this from one source, you can, in principle, fit a model of where the generator lies. And this model is called a dipole because it has two poles. And here's a, f here's a fit from that data. You see this green thing um, that's where we think the generator is. Um, and that's called dipole fitting. It's a way to localize what we observe on, this, on the scalp. It's a way to localize parameters of our models, for example. But uh, dipole fitting isn't perfect. So um, it has a few issues. And some of these are, uh, oh, before I get to that, I'll show you a few more maps here. Uh, it's, it's good to build intuition with that. So it's really important, actually. For example, um, uh, you, you might look closely at, um, at some of these 
dipole generators and where it maps on the brain. So this is a, an occipital one. It's actually two dipoles. Um, here is a frontal one. It's probably an eye blink. Um, here is one which is sort of tangential, which means it must be in a sulcus, in a fold, basically. Here's another one that's tangential. Um, here's one that's tangential. It's sort of going through the middle of the brain, or it's somewhere in the middle. In some cases, it might be things like that might actually be generated by eye activity under certain circumstances, like left-right movement, and it might be sort of a misfit. Um, yeah, and, and a few others. Uh, y you can find tons of these plots on the internet um, and, and interpret these in some way. I wanted to say what the issues with dipole fitting are. So one is uh, what you need to know where your sensors are. If you don't know it very well, your dipole fits are going to be completely off. Another one is, um, it's really a big one. There's a few uncertainties about how conductive the, the, the skull is, how conductive the cortical spinal fluid is, cerebrospinal, sorry, um, and uh, the tissue and so on. And so if you get the parameters wrong and they change with age, for example, your fits might be too deep or too shallow or things like that. And basically, preferably, you know how the cortex is folded for the person so you do, can do a better job. It, um, and so you need to get that map from somewhere, right? You can get it from an averaged head from the internet, uh, or you can measure it from the person using, using MRI, for example. So uh, it's not perfect. And certainly not everything that you observe on the head is generated by a small number of dipoles or by one dipole. You need to do a good deal of processing until you get to maps that actually look dipolar. Um, usually some signal processing. So um, to get around that, uh, there's other ways to fit the sources. Uh, one is distributed source modeling. So you can say, well, there's not a dipole that generated this. You can say, well, maybe there's a constellation of patches on the cortex that generate this, and we want to know what the constellation is. And there's lots of different techniques with different trade-offs, different assumptions, and so on. I just briefly show these pictures. Here's a linearly constrained minimum variance beamformer. It gives you some smooth blob down here. It's actually way too large, I think, to be biologically meaningful. Here's another one, anatomically constrained beam beamforming. The same data, a completely different picture, right? And so um, that shows you how far off they sometimes can be. But still, at least it doesn't show you some activity up here. Um, you have a few more, and here is one is called sparse Bayesian learning. Uh, it's one of, as far as we can tell, the best for sparse sources. It gives you extremely focal uh, solutions. So uh, I hi highlight this here uh, with the mouse also. Um, so it's two sources in this particular case that it deduced, very tiny, maybe centimeter scale or so, which, which this algorithm, quote, believes generated that observation. Um, we do have a video of that. Uh, I could quickly show you this. Um, the resolution might not be optimal, but I'll just play this real quick. It doesn't matter if the video is, is somewhat lower res. It's not highest quality anyway. <coughs> so here's a real time. Uh, we should be back in business re re relatively soon. Um, so here's a real-time reconstruction of source activity from, from a dry wireless headset, in fact. This is a Cognionix headset. So what you see is, here's front, by the way, here's back. You see so-called um, you see some activity in occipital cortex, actually in this case, parietal, which we think is associated with idling. It actually goes away when he starts to move his hand. Um, <laughs> the goal of this was to suppress motor cortex idle rhythms here. Um, so when he moves his hand, these rhythms vanish. And so the power goes down, so just like I explained. Um, so we can do it in real time, and it's rather focal. Uh, this is using an algorithm called Loretta, or is actually a variation of that. Uh, it's a constrained Bayesian Loretta.